Amen. Thank you, Pastor Mark. I'm grateful for our staff. I jumped into last week's sermon, and there are some things that I didn't share that I'd like to share this morning. First of all, I'm very excited about Pastor Ben's new little one. That's very exciting. Um, we are we want to celebrate with them. You know, one of the things you might just consider is um, dropping off a baby gift at uh, his door. It'd be kind of cool if he came back to work and he couldn't get in his office because of all of the stuff that was there uh, in front of his door. That'd be kind of neat. Um, and it's really strange because we have Pastor Ben and Amanda and both sets of grandparents attending the church. That's just a unique thing that we have going on here at Faith Bible Church. So that's exciting. Um, I do want to say that, oh, that looks terrible. Sue, what happened to my slide? Um, that's just weird, right? Um, I, I wanted to, to share with you um, that I do not know how to do key point slides clearly. I don't, I don't really don't know what happened. Um, let me just tell you what that's there for. Um, this is a strange time. I, don't, I have conversations with you just about every day about what a weird culture we live in now, um, especially as it relates to COVID and faith and where you can go and where you can travel and who you can have in your home and who you can't have in your home and all those kind of things. You know all about that. And I know that there are some of you that are struggling in a big way um, because maybe there are some things you'd like to talk about. And typically, historically, you would have just called and came up to the church. We're still here. Um, we still have office hours. And so you're welcome to come. And I'm happy to wear in my office with the door shut my mask the entire time if you desire that. Um, but also there's another option. Um, you can call us and arrange, any of the pastors, arrange a Zoom call where we can see one another, a FaceTime call, a Skype call. We're happy to do that whenever is convenient for you, or just a telephone call. One of the things we prioritize is calling around to our church family, and uh, the elders are participating with us in that. Hopefully you've received calls. If you haven't received a call, that tells me something. It tells me that your number is not in our database. If that's true of you, maybe you're new in the last you know, year to faith when COVID has struck us. If you would just call our office or even, let me just say, um, if you're watching online right now, I'm getting ready to do something that probably isn't terribly wise, but um, if you want to just text me, I would be happy to take that and give that to our church secretary at my number. It's in the worship guide. It's online. You can just text me directly to my number, your telephone number, your address. Give me your name as well, please. And we'll make sure you're in the database so you'll receive telephone calls. But if you would like to meet with a pastor, talk to a pastor, we're all here and we would love to be able to serve you however we can and give you uh, whatever counsel we're able from the word. Just know that that's always available. I want to say as well something that I did not say the beginning of last week, and that is last week was the first Sunday after our Atlanta, our vacation. Um, I'm grateful for Pastor Ben who preached while I was away and Pastor Craig who preached while I was away. They just did. I listened. I participated in both services. You can do that, you know, like anywhere you are. It's amazing. That's really the cool thing about um, what's happening now is that wherever you are, you can log on and you can be, kind of be here. But um, I appreciate that. I, I want to remind you, one of the things I kind of took away from those two weekends was uh, don't unpeople. Remember that? Don't forget that, right? That was a big, that was a big thing. We, we have a tendency to unpeople. If you don't know what I'm talking about, go back and listen to Pastor Craig's uh, message. It was, it was really good. I also want to celebrate some anniversaries. I, I do that um, whenever it comes up on my calendar. I'm reminded of uh, people who have been committed to faith for a long, long time. Uh, Donna Towns uh, in our nursery, who oversees our nursery and who makes sure all of our children uh, are secure and safe there and well taken care of, who puts stuff online on a regular basis uh, that you can uh, resource, resources for you to educate your little ones. Uh, her eight-year anniversary was not this past week, but the previous week. And so when you see Donna, when you think of Donna, Maybe just jot her a card and let her know how grateful you are for her 
eight years uh, as our nursery coordinator here. It's a big job. Let me just tell you, many times, many times, when I leave here on, uh, like, Saturdays or other days when I leave here, her car is parked out beside the kitchen. You can't see her because she hides behind the kitchen, but she's here working, so uh, just let her know. And then uh, Pastor Jerry on January the 4th, that was quite a while ago, but I wasn't here to be able to share this. Je uh, Pastor Jerry on January the 4th celebrated 38 years at Faith Bible Church. 38 years. <laughs> Pretty amazing. Uh, he, when he and Moses planted Faith Bible Church, um, we were a totally different church back in the day. So uh, again, you can just jot Pastor Jerry a note if you think about it. Um, I, I think those kind of uh, anniversaries are a big deal, right? I mean, that's a big deal. Uh, today in our world, in our culture, many people don't stay in one job for that length of time. Um, okay, well, if you have your Bibles, I'm going to ask that you turn. We're going to jump ahead a little bit this morning. Uh, we're still in Isaiah. It's our Isaiah series, uh, The Servant of the Lord. That's what we've entitled this message series uh, as we're in Isaiah. Last time we were together, we were in Isaiah chapter 27. And uh, in uh, chapter 27, we're going to jump ahead just a little bit to the beginning of the Babylonian focus of Isaiah. Chapter uh, 38 and 39 will begin and be for us a transition. Um, just so you know, um, chapters 36 and 37 have a, that we skipped over have a focus of, and there's lots of, of good stuff. You know, when you, this is the hard thing about choosing uh, a sermon series in a book like Isaiah. In order, and we could be in Isaiah, we could be in Isaiah, just like we could be in Romans, if, when we did Romans, for like 10 years. Um, so that we're not in Isaiah for 10 years, um, you sort of pick and choose where you go. That's really hard to do when you have to uh, kind of decide these kind of things a year out. But I chose to do Isaiah, and uh, we're, we're going to jump from 27 to 38 today. Chapters 36 and 37 deal with the Assyrian focus. And it's really amazing when you look at the end of chapter 37 of Isaiah, you will notice that the Lord kills 185,000 soldiers. You probably remember the story. It's an incredible story. It would be worth your time to spend some time kind of reading through that section that we of necessity have to skip over as we jump into 38 today. Today, we're looking at chapter 38, and this is a transition from that Assyrian focus to the Babylonian focus and on into the captivity. That's where we're going to be. And just so you know, this transition of chapters 38 and 39 are sort of out of order, right? Because we know that the Assyrian focus came after. Um, but but uh, Isaiah is writing his his book is being compiled from a thematic standpoint. Not We're reading through the Bible, Pastor Mark mentioned, chronologically. The book of Isaiah is not a strictly chronological book. It is a, a thematic book. And so we're going to start in chapter 38 today. What do you want? Now that's a strange question kind of to begin a message, but what do you desire the Lord to do? What, like, like, like a crazy, miraculous thing. Like something that you know no one else in the world could ever accomplish or could ever do. But you know the Lord could. What do you want Him to do? Now just hold that in your mind. Um, because I, I think He does want to work in our midst in that way. I really do. I still believe He's a God who steps into our current reality and kind of changes things up a little bit and causes us to go, that could only be God. Hezekiah, we're going to see today, had that sort of experience. Stories told of Socrates. He had a student that came to him and uh, wanted wisdom. He came to Socrates and he said, Mr. Socrates, I've come 1,500 miles to uh, gain wisdom and learning from you. I want learning, I want wisdom so bad what do I need to do? So Socrates said, meet me on the beach. So this student who wanted to follow Socrates and learn from Socrates met him on the beach and 
Socrates just took him and they waded out into water. It got deeper and deeper and deeper. And finally, Socrates just grabbed his head and pushed him underwater until he started to struggle in a big, big way, fighting to get up above the surface. Once he was up above the surface, when his resistance was completely gone, Socrates laid him out on the shore and just left. He found Socrates later and returned to him and wanted to learn the reason for that behavior. To which uh, Socrates asked, when you were under the water, what was the one thing you wanted more than anything else? To which he responded, I wanted air. The story goes on to conclude with Socrates saying, when you want knowledge and understanding as badly as you want air, you won't have to ask anyone to give it to you. What do you want more than anything? What do you want the Lord to do for you more than anything? This is what I think. I think he's wanting to do some of those things for you. But he wants you to want him, and he wants you to come to him more than you want that thing that you're holding in your mind right now. I think he wants to hear you. And I think in our culture, in our setting, at this period of time, we are so self-reliant. We have become so comfortable that we no longer think we need to go to him. We don't hear much any longer about prayer meetings, right? You know this. We don't, we pray in our service. Um, How many of us find ourselves praying at other times. Maybe we throw up emergency prayers because we have a crisis coming our way, and probably that thing that you're holding in your mind right now is something of a crisis, something of a big thing that you know nobody could touch but the Lord. But what, what's your prayer life like? Do you desire to be in the Lord's presence? I want you to turn with me to Isaiah chapter 38, and I'm going to read uh, chapter 38 in its entirety Then we're going to go back and look at it this morning. I've entitled the message, uh, Deliverance Delivered. It's easy. You can remember that, right? Chapter 38, verse 1 reads, In those days Hezekiah became mortally ill, and Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amoz, came to him and said, Thus says the Lord, Set your house in order, for you will die and not live. Then Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed to the Lord and said, Remember now, O Lord, I beseech you, how I've walked before you in truth and with a whole heart, and I've done what is good in your sight. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. Then the word of the Lord came to Isaiah, saying, Go and say to Hezekiah, he's not even out of the, out of the throne room yet, out of the palace yet. He says, Go to, and say to Hezekiah, Thus says the Lord, the God of your father David, I've heard your prayer. And I've seen your tears. Behold, I'll add 15 years to your life. I'll deliver you in this city from the hand of the king of Assyria, and I will defend this city. This shall be a sign to you from the Lord that the Lord will do this thing that he's spoken. Behold, I will cause the shadow on the stairway which has gone down with the sun on the stairway of Ahaz to go back 10 steps. So the sun's shadow went back 10 steps on the stairway on which it had gone down. A writing of Hezekiah, king of Judah, after his illness and recovery. I said in the middle of my life, am I to enter the gates of Sheol? Am I to be deprived of the rest of my years? I said, I'll not see the Lord in the land of the living. I will look on man no more among the inhabitants of the world. Like a shepherd's tent, my dwelling is pulled up and removed from me. As a weaver, I rolled up my life. He cuts me off from the loom from day until night you, you make an end of me. I composed my soul until morning. I, I think that probably should be translated. I, cry for, I cried for help until morning like a lion. So he breaks all my bones. From day until night you make an end of me. Like a swallow, like a crane, so I twitter. I moan like a dove. My eyes look wistfully to the heights. Oh Lord, I am oppressed. Be my security. For what shall I say? For He has spoken to me, and he himself has done it. I will wander about all my years because of the bitterness of my soul. O Lord, by these things men live, and all these things is the life of my spirit. 
Oh, restore me to health and let me live. Lo, for my own welfare, I had great bitterness. It is you who's kept my soul from the pit of nothingness. For you have cast all my sins behind your back. For Sheol cannot thank you. Death cannot praise you. Those who go down to the pit cannot hope for your faithfulness. It is the living who gives, gives thanks to you as I do today. A father tells his son about your faithfulness. The Lord will surely save me, so we will play my songs on stringed instruments all the days of our life at the house of the Lord. Now Isaiah had said, let them take a cake of figs and apply it to the boil that he may recover. Then Hezekiah said, what is the sign that I shall go up to the house of the Lord? <clears throat> let me make some observations about Hezekiah. First of all, then we're going to go back to our text. Hezekiah was one of the good guys. I want you to keep a finger, a bookmark in that text there in, in Isaiah. But I want you to turn back to 2 Chronicles chapter 31. 2 Chronicles chapter 31. I want you to see what this text says about this man. In chapter 31 of 2 Chronicles, beginning in uh, verse 20, here's what the text says. 2 Chronicles 31, 20. Thus Hezekiah did throughout all Judah the things that were just discussed in the previous section of chapter 31. And he did what was good and right and true before the Lord his God. Every work which he began in the service of the house of God in law and in commandment, seeking his God, and he did it with all uh, his heart, and he prospered. Now, turn to uh, Second Kings, toward the front of your Bible, just a little ways. Turn to Second Kings chapter 18. In Second Kings chapter 18, we're going to hear this text speak of King Hezekiah as well. In Second Kings chapter 18, beginning in verse 3, this text describes King Isaiah. Verse 3 reads, he, King Isaiah did right in the sight of the Lord according to all that his father David had done. He removed the high places and broke down the sacred pillars and cut down the Asherah. He also broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made, for until those days the sons of Israel burned incense to it, and it was called the Nishushtan. He trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel, so that after him there was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor among those who were before him. For he clung to the Lord, and he did not depart from following him, but kept his commandments, which the Lord had commanded Moses." This king, Hezekiah, was a good guy. The, thing that he, the things that he says about himself in, the, in this text seem to be true. The Lord doesn't come back and say, now wait a second. The Lord hears his prayer. The Lord responds. The Lord answers his prayer. Uh, this song that Hezekiah <clears throat> writes is going to be our focus this morning. But before we get there, I just want to make a point, <clears throat> excuse me, that's kind of off note and uh, just uh, something that's been on my mind since I started studying this text. Uh, you, you noticed that, and we could go back to, a, I, I think it's 2 Kings 20, that's the parallel passage that describes this same event. In that event, the order of things makes a bit more sense. The last two verses of this chapter, of chapter 38 of Isaiah, are, seem to be way, way out of order. Because in the, par in the parallel passage, we know that Hezekiah asked for a sign. What's going to be that sign? And, uh, and uh, the Lord gives him the sign of the shadow moving back the 10 steps. Whether those 10 steps were on some sort of sundial when, when that shadow moved back, whether it was just steps outside his palace or his throne room that he could see, uh, whatever the case is, and, and we're not exactly sure what, what, how that looked or how that went, all we know is somehow in that location at that day, the Lord caused the, the shadow to reverse 10 steps somehow. And that's really all that we know about that. Um, it seems to me that what the, the, the point that I want to make, though, about this first section before we get to his song is that you and I have a response, and we talk, I've talked to multiple people this last week as a result of last week's message that we have a responsibility 
to work with the Lord who is sovereign, not to just say, I'm going to trust his sovereignty and not do anything. I hope none of you got that from last week's message. Some people heard that. That's, I apologize for that if I was not clear. We serve a sovereign, powerful God who has things planned out for us. But he expects us to work with him, to walk through this life, to petition him regarding our lost friends and our circumstances. And, we, and he expects us to, to come along. He expects us to, to join him in the journey. Two times in this text, I see that very thing. I see uh, Isaiah going to Hezekiah saying, you're going to die. Get things in, get your house in order. And the text tells us that Isaiah turned his face to the wall and wept bitterly, praying that the Lord would extend his life, the Lord would step in. And the text tells us the Lord heard his prayer and said, Isaiah, before you even leave this, this palace, I want you to go back into his bedroom and say, I'm going to give you 15 more years. <clears throat> the Lord also says to uh, King Hezekiah, I'm going to heal you. I, I, I'm so, so, so Isaiah says, this is what's going on. Hezekiah pray, prays and the Lord, the Lord relents. The Lord had a plan. Uh, Hezekiah had a desire and it seemed to change things. At the end of this text, that, those last two verses that speak to uh, Hezekiah's healing, we see Jesus many times in the New Testament simply saying a word and men or women are healed. The Lord tells Hezekiah here in the first part of this chapter that God's going to heal him. But then something weird happens. They take a fig poultice and apply it to the boil. I don't know what this disease was beyond the fact that the text tells us it's a boil. But for some reason, the Lord chose not simply to make it go away and, and, and cause Hezekiah to stand up on his feet and walk out of his his uh, bedroom healed, but rather uh, Isaiah said, bring, bring a fig poultice and apply it to his wound, and Hezekiah was healed. There was God's plan. I'm going to heal him. And there was uh, the fig poultice, and somehow together it worked out to, that uh, the, Lord, the Lord took care of Hezekiah. You and I have a responsibility to join the Lord on this journey. We have a responsibility to see what his word has to say about what he expects of us and then to live that out every day. <clears throat> don't ever hear me say, don't ever hear me say, yeah, our God is a sovereign God and all we have to do is just sit back and sit down and just watch him work. I don't see that in the Bible. He expects us to be involved. We're ambassadors. They have an active role in his kingdom. We are citizens of his kingdom and as a consequence, have responsibility to be actively involved in this kingdom. I, I think those were two things, two, two uh, illustrations there that I thought were uh, significant that I wanted to share with you. Well, Hezekiah was a good king. The Lord uh, honors him, his prayer, and gives him 15 more years. And he gives him a sign of those shadows going backwards. Here's what I see in his prayer. That begins in uh, chapter 38, verse 10. You and I have to ask. God expects us to come to him. Hezekiah prays uh, because Hezekiah knows something that we all should acknowledge, and that's this. We're not in charge. We're not in control. We might think we are. We might feel we are. But if there's anything this whole COVID pandemic should show us is we're not in charge. We don't have the strength or the wisdom, the power to make things happen. But our sovereign God does. And he's, he's told us in his word in multiple places, come and talk to me. Come and lay your heart out before me. In fact, this text says the only place in the Bible that I see this is God says, I see your heart. Act, he, he, he says out loud, Hezekiah, I, I, I can perceive, I can see, I, I know your heart. God wants to see your heart. He wants to hear from you because you're not in control. The first uh, of the Hebrew words in this text, in, in uh, I'm sorry, in uh, Hezekiah's prayer in verse 3, it reads, uh, then in verse 3, uh, my text reads, and Hezekiah said, remember now, O Lord, I beseech you, 
But that first word was a passionate, please, Lord, or I pray, Lord, or oh, Lord. In fact, the NIV typically never translates that word. But when it's found at the beginning of a sentence and a section like this, it gives passion to that pericope. I appreciated Pastor Craig, uh, when he preached, actually used that word pericope. I thought nobody in the world would use that but Pastor Craig, but he didn't. And he used it exactly right. And so if you don't know what that is, you need to pick up a dictionary or Google it. Um, here, here we have the Lord the, the, in the text, Isaiah saying, Hezekiah was passionate about this and begged the Lord. One of the other times we see this is when Abraham was begging. He used this same word that in the NIV is untranslated. He used it four different times, begging for Lot and his family uh, when God was going to destroy, uh, previously was going to destroy him. Verse 10 reads, in the middle or in the noon, at the noon of my life, uh, in my middle age, um, in the prime of my life, am I to enter the gates of Sheol? What exactly did uh, Hezekiah mean here? Well, the Jews uh, thought if you died in middle age at the noon of your life, uh, God was judging you somehow for something that you'd done because that just wasn't appropriate. It, go, it gets worse than that. We know that uh, Manasseh, you remember that evil king, came from the loins of Hezekiah, one of Hezekiah's kids, he took the throne at 12. Now, this is not in my notes either, but I can't help but think this like, and I'm not making any judgment here. I, this is just kind of something for you to think about. Hezekiah pleads for more time for God to intervene, and he does for 15 years. But look what happens during that 15-year period of reprieve. Manasseh is born one of the evilest kings uh, in the history of Israel, right? So what happened to Manasseh? What happened in Hezekiah's life or his family to see that happen? Listen, we don't always know the Lord's plans. We can't see his sovereign. He expects us to work with him. And for whatever reason, he honored uh, Hezekiah's prayer. But in the midst of honoring Hezekiah's prayer, uh, Manasseh was born to Hezekiah. If this is, and this is, I haven't written this down anywhere, but, but I think it's important to say, be careful what you pray for, right? Be careful what you pray for. I think all of our prayers should end with, but not my will, but yours be done. Not what I want, Lord. You know better than I. You are a sovereign God. You're in total control. You see the beginning, the end, and everything in the middle. So, so I know you're a good God, as we've sung about all morning long, um, and so whatever you want, whatever your will is, that's, that's all I want. I have this desire, that's my heart, but I'm content with, I'm happy with, I will express joy in if you'll just give me your will. A couple of different places in the text of Scripture, we see the text telling us that men of bloodshed and deceit will not live out half their days. And that's not something Hezekiah wanted. He wanted a longer life. He didn't want to have to get his house in order. He did not want this experience of his kingship or his life to end without progeny, without offspring, and to end so early. Verse 12 says, my dwelling has been removed and carried away like a shepherd's tent. He uses two different word pictures in our text to describe his life. He says it's like a tent. Now listen, before vacation, there were four or five memorial services I participated in or attended in quick succession. It was, for me, just an incredibly sad, difficult period. But at almost every one of those that I was involved in, we discussed the fact that the New Testament describes this thing that you're looking at this morning as my tent. And the, the New Testament even uses phraseology that speaks to when I die my tent pegs being pulled up so I can, my tent can be rolled up and moved away someplace else. That's exactly what Hezekiah says here. Paul writes to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, For we know that this earthly tent, 
which is our house, when it's torn down, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands. Peter writes, for I consider it right, as long as I'm in this earthly dwelling, to stir you up by way of reminder. Both Paul and Peter describe this thing as our tent. Hezekiah used the same exact word picture, and he says, I'm just in it temporarily. That's what a tent is, right? We live in it for a time, and then we move on. We don't stay in a tent permanently. If you stayed in a tent in your backyard, all your neighbors would think you were weird, because people don't do that. It's not appropriate, right? It's appropriate for camping. And camping is something that you do temporarily. Um, second point this morning from this section is God wants to hear us. You and I need to ask, not only, first of all, because we're not in control, but secondly, because only God can heal or intervene. In these two verses, in verse 13 and 14, Hezekiah recalls what the Lord did. Remember, this is a prayer, uh, this is a song that he's written after he's been healed. So, so if sometimes you read it and it sounds like it's looking forward or contemporary to the healing, it's not at all. It's looking back at the healing. And here he says in verse 13, I, I composed my soul, probably better, I cried for help night and day uh, or until morning. Then like a lion, so he, so God, broke all my bones from day until night. You made an end of me. Basically, what I read in this text is Hezekiah saying, you are powerful beyond this. You're, you're a lion. You've devastated me. You've ruined me. You can do anything you choose to do to me because I am, I am weak. We see Hezekiah expressing his weakness in the next verse, in verse 14. He says, I'm like a bird that twitters. It's, it's, uh, the Hebrew word is supposed to sound like a twittering, chirping, peeping bird. And Hez uh, Isaiah goes on uh, to record Hezekiah's words to say, I'm like a dove that just moans. Let me just put, that, put those two images in your mind. <laughs> you got a lion who's breaking Isaiah's bones all night long, day and night, Hezekiah says, who's breaking Hezekiah's bones. And then you've got Hezekiah who's like a dove. He's like a little bird that peeps. There's no comparison there. Hezekiah saying, Lord, you are powerful and I am nothing but uh, weak. Hezekiah grew tired and exhausted because of the sickness that had found its way into his body. And it's curious to me that Hezekiah is going to the one for help that caused the problem. Isn't that interesting? Hezekiah knows who brought this to his doorstep. Hezekiah knows who's ultimately the responsible one, who either brought it or backed off and said to the enemy, feel free or just allowed his body to degrade, whatever the case is. He knows that God could have stepped in and stopped that if he didn't bring it, but he chose not to. He, he, uh, he goes to God who is ultimately responsible. He wants God to pledge to him. He asks that God be his security, that God be his surety. God, will you please be my, de my sure deposit that what you've promised me is going to come to fruition. And it's an important theological uh, concept for you and I to grasp if we're going to go to the Lord and ask anything. Because if we don't understand that the one to whom we're going has the power to change everything because he's the one that brought it in the first place or allowed it, that is what uh, monotheism is all about. He's the one God, the one true God. There's no other. All of the other gods are creations of our mind and impotent, not capable of stepping into time and reality and making changes. And they don't bring anything. Uh, that's important for us to remember. I, I like what one scholar said that uh, I, I came across as I was studying this text. He said, this truth comes to full flower in the New Testament 
where God the Son accepts our rightful judgment, which God the Father has meted out. Listen to this. Listen. In Christ, judge and convict are one and the same to our eternal benefit. I, 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 when, I, when I came across that in my study, I just, I had to stop there. Listen, I'm going to read it to you again. In Christ, judge and convict are one and the same to our eternal benefit. Jesus judged our sin and then went to the cross for us. What an incredible thought. Well, this, this text for me tells you and I that we need to ask because he's the one that can control what happens because he's the one that controls what happens. Second thing is God loves to answer our prayers. Uh, verse 15 reads, What can I say for he's both spoken to me and he himself has done it? I'll wonder about, I think wonder about, I, that's how my translation translates that text, verse 15. I, I think probably it could be translated, some of your translations read, I know, uh, walk humbly or walk softly. I think Hezekiah is saying, um, what shall I say for he has spoken to me and he himself has done it. Uh, I will wonder about all my years or I will walk humbly all my years because of the anguish of my soul. God, Hezekiah understands that God is the only one who can deliver him, um, not idols. I love, those, I love those texts in the Old Testament specifically that talk to us about the fact that idols are nothing. Um, my, favorite, my favorite is um, found in Deuteronomy chapter 4. It, it, God gives the... Moses is giving the law, and he says, when you go in the land, if you serve the idols that are in the land, um, God's going God's to banish you. He says, then you will serve gods, the work of men's hands, wood and stone. This is what my favorite part is. Uh, those idols, who are the works of men's hands, which can neither see, nor hear, nor smell. These idols can't even smell. They can't do anything. And in my my heart already knows that you're going to be worshiping them. This life we possess is a derived life, meaning that God is the author of life. In fact, that's what the text tells us in Acts chapter 3 as Peter's preaching, right? He's preaching to the crowd. He says, you killed, boy, there's irony there, right? You killed the author of life, the one who, who created life. In fact, the one who says of himself, I am life. The one who breathed life into the first dirt creation. You, you murdered him. Uh, this is a derived life. We possess life because he's given us life. And he wants to answer our prayers for life. I came that they might have life. We know that means a relationship with God, but that defines life for us. A walk with our Creator, our Heavenly Father, and that we might have it abundantly. Only God can impart to us that kind of life. Verse 16 reads, O Lord, by such things men live, and my spirit finds life in them too. You restored to me life and let me live. Here, Hezekiah is sharing in his song that his prayer was answered, that God has done it, that God gave Hezekiah 15 additional years. Verse 16 uh, develops that, that um, proclamation of praise. Restore to me health and let me live. It's a command that Hezekiah has given to the Lord. Let me live. Uh, that's what I want and I know that the only place I can, I can find life is in you. Well, the, the text tells you and I uh, in Matthew and other places that how many of you can add even a single hour to your lives by being anxious? We don't have that control. No one else has that ability. Only the Lord who is the author of life. Well, next section of uh, Hezekiah's song, I believe this last section, uh, God needs to hear from us. He wants to hear from you. Just like he heard from Hezekiah, he wants to see your heart and longs as your father to fulfill your desires. 
Now, I don't know what that thing was that you're, you held in your mind when I ask you what you wanted most, what thing you wanted the Lord to do for you. I, I'm not, pro- listen to me, I'm not promising you that the Lord's going to do that. I can't do that. But I'm promising that he wants to move in and he wants to shake up your world. He wants to demonstrate himself sovereign in your life. I'm convinced of that somehow or other, just like he did Hezekiah, because he's the same God. Well, this last few verses of his song, Hezekiah says God answered his prayer, but he answered his prayer for his glory. God answers out just like God answers our prayer for his own glory. And verse, look at verse 17. Lo, for my own, uh, Hezekiah sings, lo, for my own welfare, I had great bitterness. It's you who's kept my soul from the pit of nothingness, destruction, for you have cast all my sins behind your back. Here Hezekiah acknowledges that the bitter anguish was for his own benefit, for his own welfare. That's what he says. I know that, Lord, you brought this, you allowed this. Whether it was the disease, whatever that looked like, or the healing, it's for my benefit, for my learning. I was talking to someone just yesterday. We were, this person had a question about Hebrews 12, and we were just discussing that text. That text talks much about God's discipline that you and I need to accept and embrace God's discipline because it's for our own good. He wants you and I, and, and at the beginning of that text, at the front part of chapter 12, you recall that the writer of Hebrews says, fixing our eyes on Jesus, who is the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. And then he says, listen, you all need to endure, and you've not endured to the point of bloodshed yet. Now... Accept your father's discipline. Your father disciplines you like a son, like a daughter, because he loves you and he wants you to be your character, your person to be sculpted into the image of Jesus. So that, listen, so that you'll be strong. So that you'll be mature. That's what Hezekiah is saying here. You want me mature. You want me to have learned things. You want me to be strong. Hear me when I say, um, I've shared with you before, and I'll confess that this rain has just messed up my walking schedule. I didn't walk yesterday because it was rain. I got up, fully dressed, walked outside and went, nope, and turned around and back like early in the morning, like 5 o'clock in the morning. Um, I haven't walked yet today. I do six miles a day. Let me just tell you, sometimes it's really, really painful. Like, like I, don't, I don't mean like I'm crying painful, but it's difficult, especially at that hour to get up, get dressed, and get out there when it's not like nice out. I've, I've walked in the rain before. I just had an attitude the other day. Um, and it's a shock. Um, has it, listen, that, that walking is, while painful, is not, I'm not doing it to put miles on my feet. I'm not doing it just to record on my phone how many miles I've done. I'm not doing it simply to to gain what I gain from listening to the podcasts I listen to. I'm doing it to get stronger, to grow up. There's there's uh, an end result that has nothing to do with the six miles, right? You get that. It's the same thing with your lives. It's the same thing with the junk that finds its... It's uh, it, fa- that we find falling across our paths. That stuff is designed for you and I who love the Lord. It's designed to sculpt us if we'll allow it. Now, now, if you rebel against it, if you chafe against it, there's, there's, likely, there's a great likelihood that it's not going to change you at all. Um, it might even make you worse. But if you accept it, if you embrace it, and you say, Lord, I know that you are a sovereign God. You either brought this stuff or you allowed this stuff. Either way, even this can be used for my good. I want to be stronger, Lord. I want to be more mature, Lord. I want to express Jesus' character uh, to a greater degree, Lord. So whatever you have to do in me through this stuff, do that. That's what Hezekiah is saying. That's what we can see here. Uh, that the Lord wants to do. 
And he, and he wants to do that in us so that we'll better, you get this, right? So that we'll better reflect him. How do you reflect him? Are you embracing that stuff? Are you like Hezekiah saying, um, this is all as a result of um, the stuff that I need to become more like you? Now, at the end of verse 17, <clears throat> pretty familiar text, you have cast all my sin, Hezekiah says, behind your back. Some of you who struggle to embrace the stuff that finds its way across your path struggle as a result of not, like I've written in my Bible, you and I need to live into not only God's forgiveness, but his forgetfulness, right? Right? Some of us listen to that enemy way, way too long, and um, because we've listened so long sometimes and we haven't been in the Word, it's tough for us to discern between God's voice and the enemy's voice, or God's voice and our own condemning voice. So every time you approach him and you want to ask, all you hear is, he doesn't care about you because you are a rebellious, sinful child, and you believe that. Listen, if you if you receive the forgiveness that Jesus provides, just like Hezekiah can say, you have cast my sin behind your back, meaning you don't look at it. It's gone. It's history. It's the same thing. It's true of you as well. So when you hear when you come to the Lord and ask and you think I know that he wants to hear me, he wants to see my heart, he wants to he wants to to uh, change things in his child's life. And you hear that voice that says, You're, he does, he's not going to listen to you. You are a rebellious, sinful child. <clears throat> you got to stop that. You got to live into not just his forgiveness, but his forgetfulness as well. Because he's forgotten your sin. He'll never bring it up again. I've quoted this passage for you over and over and over and over. I hope you've got it memorized. Romans 8.1. There is therefore now no condemnation. So when that voice comes up that condemns you, when you go to him and ask, and you consider just like Hezekiah, Lord, I know you want to do stuff for me, and you hear that voice, listen, there is no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. You've got to, you've got to speak against that. Lord, I know that's not your voice. It can't be your voice, because if it's your voice, you're speaking contrary to what you revealed to me in your word. And I know that's not possible. You and I need to live into our, his forgiveness, but also his forgetfulness. So his forgiveness is a reason to glorify him. His faithfulness, uh, Hezekiah says in verse 18, is a reason to glorify him. He, Hezekiah says, for sale, that, that place of death cannot thank you. Death cannot praise you. Those who go down to the pit cannot hope for your faithfulness. Um, the Old Testament doesn't give us a very clear glimpse of the afterlife. And, and we have more revelation in the New Testament, not considerably more. In other words, we don't know, we don't have all the, our jots and tittles taken care of in the New Testament, right? As far as the afterlife is concerned. But it was even darker back in this day. And the Jews didn't know much about what lay beyond death. Uh, it was just kind of dark for them. And so here, I believe what Hezekiah wants you and I to hear is that, um, listen, in this life, if I die and I leave and I go to Sheol, that, that holding place of, of dead ones, I'm not going to be able to talk about your faithfulness. You are a faithful God. You are a sovereign God. I want to tell my children, what happened to Manasseh? Like, I still have that question, right? Sometimes I've said to you before, when you study the word and you get closer to the text, you have more questions like, it creates more questions like, how did Manasseh grow up with this guy and turn out to be such a bad guy? I'm not exactly sure I can answer that question, but, but Hezekiah says, I want to talk about your faithfulness. I want to glorify you here. It's not that I can't glorify you in heaven. I, it's not that I can't sing your praises in heaven, but I want to tell my children, I want to tell my sons, he says, of your faithfulness, God. I'm going to glorify you that way. Well, and then he says, he answers our prayer for his glory. The last point here is in verses 19 and 20. Um, forever is to be the length of our praise. In 19 and 20, he says, It's the living who give thanks to you as I do today. A father tells his sons about your faithfulness. The Lord, the Lord will surely save me 
So we will play songs on stringed instruments all the days of our life at the house of the Lord. The manner in which Hezekiah glorifies God will encourage others to pray when they're sick, to talk to him about the things on their heart, so that the living will also rejoice and praise because of the way God grants full life and requests to his children. Can I ask you a question? What would you do if God gave you 15 extra years? What would you do if God cleared up this pandemic this afternoon? And he could. He, I'm convinced he could. What would you do? Would this be the desire of your heart to glorify and honor him? Now, now stop with me to think just for a second. If that's not your desire today, uh, I have a question about whether it's going to be your desire tomorrow. You know, here at Faith Bible Church, we talk about sharing instinctively. Um, that means, like, talk about Jesus and discussing his word is just something that's instinctively done. It's, it's like second nature, or first nature, really, right? It just falls off your lips like, hey, I was talking to the Lord the other day, and he said, or, and I said. Or, the Lord answered a prayer that I've had for years now, and it was this. Or, I was having, spending time with the Lord in my quiet time the other day, and one of the things that he impressed upon me was, it's just natural, it's instinctive. If that's not happening today, it's not going to happen in the next 15 years. If he gives you 15 years, how are you going to use it? Are you going to use it for his glory? Or are you going to just build up your bank account? You're going to just uh, uh, build on to your home. You're just going to try to win the acclaim of the crowd. I, I don't know. I don't know what it is. He, he wants you to come to him. He wants to hear from you. We've got to ask. We've got to, he wants to partner with us in ministry. We're weak. He's strong. We have, we, we have a derived life. He possesses life. He's the author of life. Um, but he wants you to glorify him. Not, not for the next 15 years today. When you leave here today, he wants you, you to glorify him. You got to do that? I'm going to close this in prayer, but I'm going to give you just a couple of minutes to, to think about that, to consider that. Are you today sharing instinctively? Are you today committed to glorifying God? Whatever that means in your world, do you, does Jesus, I mean the, the name your best friend, that's what you've said to me. Does Jesus' name just kind of fall off your lips like you're talking about a friend, a spouse, a child, a grandchild, a neighbor? Should. Should. Talk to the Lord just for a minute, and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close this with our benediction. Father, the hour is late, but what a strange text that you, you caused the shadow to move backwards 10 steps, whatever that meant in that day, whether it was the entire sun or just in that region or was whatever it was, whether it, were, whether it was steps on the palace or whether it was some sort of sundial, whatever that happens to be, but you healed Hezekiah. You heard his prayer. You honored his prayer. And Father, I, I'm convinced that you want to work in similar ways in our lives. You want to conform us to the image of our Savior, the Lord Jesus. You want to step into our lives and hear from us, answer our prayers. Father, I, I know that there are several in the room that need your touch, that need to hear from you, that need you to step into their worlds that are crumbling, people who have lost hope, people who are at the end of their rope, people who don't know where to turn, people who have sought relief from countless other directions, and today they're begging you, as Hezekiah did. They're pleading with you to heal them, to touch them, to change their circumstance. Father, I pray that you would do that and that they would glorify you with their lips, that they would talk of your goodness and your faithfulness, 
that they would live in not just they would live into not just your forgiveness but your forgetfulness that they would understand what it means to be a child before you without condemnation father i pray that faith bible church is a place where you are glorified not a place where we seek our own not a place where we put ourselves first but a place where you're free to do whatever you choose to do. Father, you are sovereign. We are weak, and we acknowledge that today. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with us? Just in light of Hezekiah's song, would you sing this with me? Say, And hallelujah, you have saved. So much better this way, and hallelujah, great defender. It's so much better this way, and when I thought I lost me, you know. such a mess sometimes. I was standing in the back and I was thinking, I wish the live stream people could mess up Pastor Craig's um, part of the service every week. Because I, I told him I worry that DTS is going to find out, because he's a student, they're going to find out how good he is and steal him. So my prayer is, Lord, but then we have Robert Riggs who works at the seminary, like, so we can't even do that. I'm so grateful for Pastor Craig and his leadership and, and his team that he's assembled leading us. Um, I, I want to remind you as you leave today, we here at Faith Bible Church are committed to keeping ourselves and you as safe as we can. Um, this is a pretty big room and we're seeing people feel comfortable and come back, which we're thrilled with. I'm thrilled with, right? But we, we just need to make sure that on campus that we're masked. I know it's a hassle, but I just want to say it out loud. We have that commitment just to keep you safe and help you keep other people safe. Um, hospital beds and ICUs today are like 100%. We don't want anybody else having to go there. So please, when you're on campus, plan to uh, be masked. There are masks. We've purchased some. They're in the foyer. You can pick them up there. But uh, just be safe, right? Just be safe. Do everything you can to keep away from this virus. Now unto him who's able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before his presence with exceeding great joy. To the only wise God and our Savior be glory, dominion, majesty, and power both now and forevermore. And all God's people said, all right, we're going to dismiss you. And we're going to dismiss the back section first. You all can go. Thank you for being here online. If you are online here at Faith Bible Church today, we're thrilled 
that you're here. We'd welcome you back uh, physically on campus whenever you choose to return.